Hello and welcome to Small Gold. In case you missed it, top gold, silver, and cryptocurrency stories for the week ended April 1st, 2018. Happy Easter. Trump steps up trade rhetoric. Trump threatens Mexico with end to NAFTA over border control. That's one of the stories we're going to be covering. We're also going to be taking a look at China introduces the yuan-denominated oils futures contract with no gold component during the week. We're going to take a look at the DOJ and FBI's problems with informants. We sense a pattern here. Sessions, Attorney General Sessions says there will be no special counsel to investigate Mueller, Comey, McCabe, and FISA abuses. Silver fights cancer. Congress passes a massive omnibus budget without reading it, and Trump signs it. A congressman has introduced a gold standard bill. And we have, we're going to revisit some dollar collapse warnings from 50 years ago. The gold-silver ratio remains elevated at 81 to 1. Crypto's tank. Trump scores trade deal with South Korea. And we're going to look at Irish gold mining and Finnish silver mining. We're seeing some precious metals mining returning to Europe. And horrible U.S. Mint gold sales in March and lackluster silver sales. So those are some of the stories. Let's get right at them. But first, let's take a look at the week's movement in gold and silver. Uh, gold is rising or has been rising all year. And that's a lot, I think, to do with this tariff turmoil. It's more likely to soar. Uh, if China's bubble burst due to the strain of tariffs or their own credit bubble than it is because of any gold-backed or gold-convertible yuan BS story. And, of course, that story did turn out to be complete nonsense. We do have a yuan-denominated oil futures contract, but there's no mention of gold whatsoever. Let's take a look at the gold-silver ratio. It remains at 81 to 1 over 80 to 1 for a couple of weeks now. And as I mentioned... That the silver pumpers don't understand is that the gold silver ratio may indeed be sustainable. You can click here. It's a long explanation there. I've also listed um, some more. This is a story in the Wall Street Journal, basically saying that silver being low is a harbinger of a bad economy because a good portion of silver's demand is industrial. But let's skip on that. Let's just take a look at where gold closed the week. It was down about twenty twenty one dollars. And silver closed the week about uh, 15 cents lower. Not much change in both metals, and the gold-silver ratio remains at about 81 to 1. Later in the week, I'm going to go through some of the reasons why the gold-silver ratio is almost meaningless. Meaning, when I say it's meaningless, I don't mean it's meaningless today. I mean that it's very hard to go back in history and find a time where the gold-silver ratio had basically gold and silvers being compared on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. Because first of all, they can't be apples-to-apples because they're two different metals. They do share monetary history. But even that monetary history is not consistent. There are periods of time when there was gold in circulation and silver was not. Silver was in circulation and gold was not. There's, there's a whole bunch of differences. I've listed them here. I'll do a full video on it uh, later in the week, I hope. But there were periods of time where the gold price was controlled, manipulated, set at a certain price, and silver wasn't. There were other times in the history of silver where silver's price was artificially boosted higher for political reasons, for helping out the Nevada mining lottery, mining lobby. So there's never really been a consistent case where gold and silver have been measured next to each other really i'd say the last uh, since 1975 is probably the best period where you have of consistency where there hasn't been much of a change you have the hunt brothers period and that of course drove the silver gold silver ratio down because you had a concerted effort to drive the price well there wasn't a concerted effort to drive the price of silver up but that was the impact that the hunt brothers had but you also have a period now where nothing much has changed since 1975. Before that, you can see, if you look at the list I've prepared here, there were a lot of changes going on in the gold and silver markets, and it's very difficult to view the two of them versus each other on a somewhat apples-to-apples -apples basis. But anyway, we'll go through that later in the week. Let's take a look at the week's stories now. We did the week in Moronica already. You can check that out. It's up on BitChute and YouTube. Reminder, please subscribe to BitChute as well and uh, subscribe to the Smuggle channel. You never know when we are, get booted off of this YouTube. You never know. Might say one thing wrong, get one strike, say another thing wrong, and next thing you know, three strikes, you're out. 
We also covered the Geneva and Bolton joining the Trump team. I'm not going to go through that, but uh, please check those out. And then they also, we learned that Geneva is not going to be on the team, at least for the defense. And we did a video on what that means, so you can check that out as well. And now, let's get into the news about Mueller and Comey. And if you've seen the movie Black Mass or know anything about the Whitey Bulger case, this was a case where the FBI basically deputized Whitey Bulger, who is a mobster, in Boston. And the idea of deputizing him or giving him immunity and using him as an informant was that they can gather information, or he would be helpful to gather information uh, about the Italian mafia and they could put them out of business. Now, the issue here is, however, while they had listed him as an informant, Whitey Bulger always insisted he wasn't an informant, and basically his his point of view of the whole story was that he had corrupted the FBI and he had corrupted the DOJ, the Boston, all the law enforcement there. So basically they were working for him and what they were doing, because they were on the payroll, the way they justified their dealings with Bulger was they labeled him as an informant and they basically allowed him to run free and do his business because they were focused on the Italian Mafia. Now, little known fact is that the Attorney General at the time was Robert Mueller. Now, he was not involved in the local FBI Boston um, shenanigans or even the Department of Justice where apparently this guy, I think his name is Brendan O'Sullivan, had basically or purportedly made a deal with Whitey Bulger of, of basic mutual immunity, whereas Bulger would protect uh, Brendan's life because he prosecuted the mafia, and Brendan would not ever prosecute Whitey Bulger. And this is the fact that this guy was a mobster. He committed multiple murders that were proven later on and did a lot of extortion, and he was never, ever, ever even arrested or prosecuted for any of his crimes during his period as mob boss in the Boston area. Also, the um, the FBI guy, there was another um, uh, FBI person who ended up being the fall guy as, as being the person who supposedly was the only guy at the FBI that was working with Bulger. He finally was um, found guilty of colluding. However, the reason I'm bringing this up is this seems not just to be the first and only time that we've had this issue with the FBI, because during the week we learned that Omar Martin, now he is the father of one, of one of the, or the supposed only shooter in the Pulse nightclub. <clears throat> now apparently these, Omar's um, father, Siddiqui, worked for the FBI as an informant for 11 years. And he was under investigation for sending money to Afghanistan back and forth. His son ends up being involved in the uh, Pulse nightclub shooting. His wife is under, uh, I guess she was under arrest and she was charged with aiding and abetting. And somehow it came out because she filed a motion uh, seeking to dismiss charges. Uh, basically, I guess on the same theory that Whitey Bulger was saying was, look, I was immunitized. I was given immunity, basically. This is a really crazy argument by the FBI, the DOJ, to do what I wanted, and therefore I can't be held responsible for my crimes because they basically said they weren't going to arrest me. Now, that reflects poorly on the FBI or the DOJ if they did indeed do that, but we also saw during Comey's, um, this doesn't do with the formants, but the granting of immunity of all of basically Hillary's people that were around her, the people that were involved in the setting up of the server, her counsel, and so on. So this concept of giving people immunity is not uncommon, and working with informants or calling them informants and still working with them, even if they're not informants. What's interesting here is this guy, Omar Mateen, is very curiously tied to Hillary Clinton because there he is at a Hillary rally, and you don't get to sit you know, two feet behind her unless you've passed all your clearances. And there's other pictures of uh, Omar's father uh, at the local. This was a this was an event in Florida just a few days after the Pulse shooting. There he is sitting there. And then there's another picture of him or an interview with him at a local uh, TV station going on about how he supports Hillary Clinton. So here he is, an informant, Whitey Bulger we have, as supposedly an informant. And now I bring that up to the same 
case where we now are talking about um, the Steele dossier. Another informant, this guy who did the Steele dossier, Christopher Steele, I think is his name, he was an FBI informant. And what happens in these cases is they work with them and then they turn on the informant and they fire Christopher Steele for talking to the press. But basically, just like they fired that the... Um, the FBI agent who had been working with Bulger, they know they have to somehow make it look like they weren't really working with these guys. And when they found out that they were bad apples, then they got rid of them. They took appropriate action. And they do that to make sure that the entire team that was working on it isn't tainted. So that's what happened in the Steele dossier. In the Steele dossier case, you had Christopher Steele, who was an FBI informant, and then all of a sudden... You know, they fire him, but after they used his information as informant to get what they wanted, which was the Pfizer warrants. So we do see a pattern here of using informants. And also you see this curious connection then to Hillary Clinton, because not only was Omar Mateen seen with Hillary Clinton, but also you've got these pictures of Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Hillary Clinton with the... Um, the sheriff in the Parkland, whatever that town is there in in Florida where, the, where they had the mass shooting. So, again, not trying to be a conspiracy theorist here, but there does seem to be some connection between the FBI, the DOJ, and political figures and the use of informants. You can read a lot more about this. If you want to research this, you can watch those movies on Whitey Bulger. You could uh, read Sarah Carter's work on Robert Mueller and his past. And uh, you can also check out the latest story about Omar Mateen uh, and his, uh, his wife and his father being a FBI informant. So very interesting indeed there. Now let's move on now to this FISA abuse. And this is curious, too, because Sessions, if you think about the Hillary Clinton case, it was or should have been or was a criminal investigation. It was always covered up that it wasn't. The amount of things that Hillary Clinton did, I'm not saying she, we proved that she did them, although what Comey said she did, although it wasn't a trial, to me was enough to say that there was criminal activity. And clearly there should have been a criminal investigation. Well, if you think about what's happened to Donald Trump, there really has been, there was no smoking gun evidence that required a special counsel, but they got that right away. But at the same time, Hillary Clinton, there never seemed to be, they, they just did not go after her on a criminal basis. And we also see that there appears to have been pretty much smoking gun evidence to go after Donald Trump because of the FISA abuses and because of the people that were involved and because the source of the FISA warrants being the informant, Christopher Steele's dossier, which was paid for by the, and they knew it was that, and they didn't tell the judge, and apparently the judge was buddies with the FBI people. And you see now, those are facts that a DOJ, a attorney general, uh, the Department of Justice Attorney General Sessions would clearly say, this looks, work, looks like it's worth looking into. Instead, Sessions says, oh, we only do that in extraordinary cases. And it sounds just like Comey saying, uh, well, no reasonable prosecutor would have prosecuted Hillary Clinton. Nonsense. Of course they would have, based on what she did. And of course these are extraordinary circumstances. So it just seems very odd to me that you've got Sessions backing down you from investigating what happened with the FISA warrants or even the handling of the Clinton investigation, where they all seem to have... There's already evidence that's leaked to the public, and we're going to get that Inspector General's report that appears that they were clearly working to get her off. You had the meeting with Loretta Lynch on the tarmac with Bill Clinton. You had Comey basically not just making, making a recommendation that there's to be no prosecution when that prosecution decision should have been made by the DOJ, and Loretta Lynch already recused herself from it. So they set up a circumstance which basically deputized Comey to say we're not going to prosecute Hillary Clinton and they then went ahead and illegally spied on the Trump campaign. Okay, so where does that leave us? So Rod Rosenstein has officially been served a subpoena to appear to produce documents to the committee. You got to remember a congressional committee when it does an investigation, that's all it does. It has no real powers to co to convene a grand jury. It doesn't can't 
do a criminal investigation so they can come up with this information but it doesn't help you really need the department of justice to be involved you need the appointment of a special prosecutor you know in order to be able to file charges so what Sessions has done is he has appointed somebody outside of Washington. I forgot his name. It doesn't matter what his name is. He's out in Utah. But he reports to Rosenstein as an FBI. So I don't, I don't know how this guy is really going to do a thorough investigation, whether it's going to have any teeth. And Sessions rejected the call for the special counsel. I put balls here. This is ridiculous. This is a guy, McCabe. He's looking for a GoFundMe to help support his legal bills. Now, I do have sympathy for people who are being sued and uh, often unjustly, and it does cost a lot of money, and I can understand a GoFundMe campaign. But this guy's loaded. Apparently, he's worth $11 million. He's not like he's been targeted. He seems to have been recommended by his own department to be fired. And uh, so I, I just don't know why he's asking for 150000 I don't expect he'll get much from the common person. He may get donations from his rich buddies but uh, I think he should have kept that to himself and just asked them for the money directly instead of going to the public and asking for it now this budget passed which is really ridiculous and they said no one had time to read it and you hear that all the time but then I always ask who the heck had the time to write these this thing I mean we know the answer is just that basically these things are written by lobbyists they're put in front of pieces put in front of uh, the Congress people, then someone assembles it, puts it into a bill, and I guess the congressmen look for the piece that their lobbyists want, as long as it's in there, they're going to vote for it. But one thing I did find was that the Omnibus Bill will fund the Office of Inspector General to publish OIG reports, so maybe we'll get to see that OIG report online when it comes out. Now, dollar collapse. Doing some research on the gold standard and you know the gold when nixon quote abruptly ended the bretton woods agreement in august of 1971 that was a long time coming we know in the mid 60s that de gaulle uh, the germans the, the swiss were sending over their warships to the united states with their dollars to collect from the u.s treasury the gold that they were entitled to convert for their dollars under the bretton woods agreement and the u.s was freaked out about that because U.S. was starting to have trade deficits, foreigners, foreign central banks were starting to accumulate dollars, and they knew the gold was being drained, and also that they had an obligation uh, to back the, the dollar with gold for international purposes. And this is in 1968, I found this is Senator Williams, I didn't do the research on who Senator Williams is, but they're having this congressional hearing, so that's correct. The problem with the international loss of confidence in the American dollar and that is based primarily upon the loss of confidence in our own fortitude here in Congress and the administration to bring our own fiscal position under control. Well, the song remains the same. The U.S. has had problems even when they had a gold standard. And this is when there was no whiff of the fact that the U.S. couldn't even pay out on the gold in 1968. Every time the ships arrived at port, they left with the gold. There was never any hesitation. But still, there was a loss of confidence in the dollar because, not just they were probably concerned eventually there wouldn't be enough gold, but they saw the profligate ways of the United States government. Remember, 1968, you've got hundreds of thousands of troops in Vietnam. You got a space race going on. They're close to trying to land someone on the moon. You've got the second or third year of Medicaid or Medicare spending. You still got Social Security spending. And basically, the world was worried. Americans are worried that the dollar was going to collapse. Well, this is 50 years ago. This is a congressional hearing in March of 1968. So I would just say that all currencies are based on confidence, even if they're backed by gold, because the confidence has to be that the gold that is backing it is indeed there. So that's why when I hear these game over for the dollar, dollar collapse imminent, at least 50 years we've been hearing it we heard it from the highest levels of congress and senate in 1968 and this is even when there was a gold backing and then when the gold backing was removed it was game over for the dollar it's always game over for the dollar but you have to remember all these other currencies just as fiat just as profligate just as money printing as the u.s fed 
And as we noted during the week, even though we did not have the gold vacuum on, the game changer gold exchangeable on the Shanghai gold exchange, well, because we didn't have that, nothing changed. But the dollar did hegemon higher up to about, the dollar index went to about 91. Now, Donald Trump, big shocker today, Mexico is doing very little, if not nothing, is stopping people from flowing into Mexico through their southern border and then into the U.S. They laugh at our dumb immigration laws. They must stop the big drug and people flows or I will stop their cash cow NAFTA need wall. All right. So Trump getting tough on trade. Maybe that's how he gets in to pay for the wall. But he is basically sounds like he's fed up. This is on Easter where he's not really <laughs> spending much time celebrating Easter. He's tweeting away about what he's going to do about this global trade situation. Now, the U.S. did have a, a victory in the trade wars. U.S. exempted South Korea from steel tariff, but import, imposes import quotas. Interestingly enough, the reaction from South Korea was they're going to allow twice the amount of U.S. cars into Korea. So this tariff, as I've mentioned all along, is not meant to be a permanent tariff. I think it's meant to rebalance trade, to strike trade deals with nations that are willing to, to be friendly, and I'm sure you'll get some good deals out of China. You've got one out of South Korea. And you may get one out of Mexico. And this would all show that if indeed the trade does change, it's because the countries realize it's in their interest to do so and that they've gotten a really good deal so far. And they want to continue to get at least a good deal, if not the best deal like they already have. And there it is. Trump secures major trade deal with South Korea. Now, I talked at length with trade with uh, Jason Barak at uh, Wall Street for Main Street. There's a link there. You can check out that video on trade that I did with Jason uh, earlier in the week. Sun Tzu. Now, what China is doing, and again, this is a positive for everyone, as a result of the tariffs on Chinese goods, China has cut VAT taxes for certain manufacturing and other sectors. Now, why are they doing that? Because they know that these sectors are going to get hurt on the tariff. So all China is doing is offsetting and the, the VAT on these corporations, which means, in a sense, that China itself, the, the government, is going to get less money. So basically, this means they're making their manufacturers hold, which stayed on anyway. But the point being is that um, this is having an impact where China has to react and... So there you see, and we see this also in a few other sectors of the economy, China cutting uh, taxes for industries that Trump wants to punish. That's another headline there. And I say it's to offset the losses from tariffs. And here's another one talking about South Korea. Trump scores his first revised trade deal win. And here China cuts tax rates for chip makers. So we saw some manufacturers and now chip makers as well. And some of these chip makers might be the ones that, that Trump has identified as not paying the IP uh, license fees. So China's trying to help them out there. Now, during the week, the gold back you on without the gold launch. I'm not going to go into that. I did an entire video on that. You could check that out. There's all the gold and the gold back you on. Didn't happen. And now China. China regulators ban TV parodies amid content crackdown. This is something these these gold these Chinese worshippers don't understand. All they see is China's gold. They don't see the surveillance state, the totalitarian society. China regulator bans TV parodies. There's a new movie out called The China Hustle. I'm sure <laughs> it's not very flattering of, of China. It talks about the fraud that goes on there, the execution of people who speak out against the fraud. Um, but the idea that China is somehow a moral savior of the ills of the dollar and how they're going to end dollar hegemony and they build stuff and they're just great productive people. That's just drilled into people's head on YouTube constantly. End of multipolar world, end of dollar hegemony. China's going the Belt and Road. There's a story now on the Belt and Road on how that's becoming a big debt Ponzi scheme as well. Now, people also keep saying, but China has built all the infrastructure. All we've done is is just bought junk from China. Well, yeah, we bought a lot of, quote, junk from China. What do you think that infrastructure is made of? You think that infrastructure isn't made with the same care as the junk 
supposedly they send here an infrastructure that isn't being used and can't be used in an economic collapse is not an asset it's a liability not only do you owe the money that you spent to build it it needs to be maintained and why would you maintain anything that isn't being used for one day in the future when the economic when you need to use it for economic purposes well if you have an economic collapse the current infrastructure is good enough you don't need to expand into your ghost cities and to drive over bridges to nowhere so those bridges and ghost cities end up in further disrepair you still owe the money on them and now you have to maintain them so i don't get this idea that somehow what china did was smart they're playing the long game no they brought demand forward there's nothing genius or sun Tzu about that all that is is spending money on credit to drive gdp and employment it doesn't give you anything an unproductive asset is not an asset of value it's a liability yeah declaring rotten state rotting state-owned property to be an asset is 100 percent false it was and is a misappropriation of capital and labor brought about by central planning why maintain infrastructure that produces no return they won't unproductive infrastructure is a liability not an asset malinvestment is malinvestment no matter who does it but to the dollar collapse crowd u.s debt is bad but chinese debt is good why because the simple line of reasoning goes if the dollar collapses gold goes higher never th never thought of a chinese ponzi scheme surveillance state all the social credit scoring they don't care as long as gold goes higher and china's behind it china's their gold buddy see lending money to yourself is one of the criticisms well they, they always like to say about china well china owes that money to itself it's no big deal yeah but they're not willing to excuse the u.s unfunded liabilities which are quote loan to ourselves that's keynesian apologists when when they say oh we don't have to worry about social security or or medicaid medicare uh, future liabilities that's all money we owe to ourselves no you do have to worry about it it's still money and when they try to say that china's 50 trillion dollars in credit bubble does it matter because they owe it to themselves somehow that's okay it's not okay debt is debt has to be paid well here you go china's cracking down on jaywalkers with artificial intelligence facial recognition and automatic fines not only that they get you going like that but then they 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 catch you on facial recognition scans and then they immediately text you a fine but they got gold so if you want to live in a society where you just you get texted a fine for jaywalking and they know when you cross the street illegally good luck move there see how it goes see if you can send back information to the united states see if you can get on the internet see if they'll let you stay on the internet i know the united states has censorship issues but at least there's a semblance of a first amendment there at least is a way of going to another corporation perhaps and trying to get around that censorship in china it's is much more iron fisted and it's government run i'm not saying see the thing is yes the united states has its issues with the federal reserve has its issues with the dollar has all the issues they point out but what drives me nuts is that they never mention that china has any issues they just look at china and make it sound like well they got gold so they must be they must be good hard working productive honest people and the government must be the same sound money here's a story you want to check this as an asian ek review which is not a fan i'm not a fan of that newspaper but apparently and i've looked at it it looks decent but who knows they basically go through uh how it's going so far and they're basically saying there's some big issues with the belt and road project now remember we covered a story called the the counter to the belt and road led by the quad which is the u.s india australia and japan where they're doing their, they're also engaged in built in road financing activities running somewhat competition to china's built in road china's defunct space lab hurtling towards earth for re-entry here's the latest gold bug uh, hero turkey turkey is such a great place and uh well they got gold and uh they're wonderful Burble, we talk about the five cryptocurrencies. They're remaining at about 75%. That's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, Bcash, and Litecoin of market cap of the top 
the cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies took a dive during the week. They say it's because of a banning on Twitter of cryptocurrency ads, but th that shouldn't explain. I think it's just they all went up too high, and now they're all coming back down to earth, and I think any story that's negative, they will um, use an opportunity to sell. Now, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin are the most popular cryptocurrencies amongst millennials, which means probably they're the most popular cryptocurrencies because millennials are pretty much the people that are buying those things. Now, there's this Abra app with Litecoin, smart contracts. The guy in Abra is pumping that Bitcoin is going to go soaring and skyrocketing later in the year. You see this pumping on the Litecoin, the Bitcoin, the gold, the silver. They, they Assets that are just based on pumping. Litecoin was down $100 this month. It went down to $110, I think. It was over $200 less than a month ago. This one is odd. The express.co.uk got into pumping Litecoin a couple, two, three, four weeks ago. It's talking about LightPay. It's going to gain change, and Litecoin's going to overtake Bitcoin. And, and then it drops, and now they're talking about Litecoin not making it. Is Litecoin dead? Taking a battering? Will it survive? I don't, know. I don't think anyone knows what's going on with these things. But this one, I, I do think I know what's going on is, now, while Twitter banned cryptocurrency ads, and so did Google, and so did uh, Facebook, and so did a lot of places, I, that doesn't mean they're against Bitcoin, or Litecoin, or cryptocurrencies. ICOs are where they're being advertised. You don't advertise Bitcoin. There's nothing to advertise, other than you want it to go up. Bitcoin doesn't do anything. It already is there. It's just it is, and there's an infrastructure, and there's miners, and there's buyers, and there's transactions, and there's no money to be made on that other than, I guess, selling services around it or trading fees other than the price goes up or the price goes down. you got a short interest, whatever it is. What these bans advertising are on are designed to go against the fraudulent ICOs where it's basically a company, but it's issuing a token and it says, this token's going to do this, it's going to do that, get your money in quickly. And then people just send money in because there's a white paper and someone's going to issue a token. That's what they want to clamp down on because those are under securities laws. Those are people or companies making false statements or misleading statements in order to get the money. There is no money to send to get to Bitcoin. It's already there. Whether you send the money or not, it doesn't help the Bitcoin. But these ICOs are reliant on touting publicity, YouTubers, uh, advertisements, celebrity endorsements uh, to get their money. And I, that's what they're going after. So Jack Dorsey said the same week that his company banned uh, cryptocurrency advertising that he thinks Bitcoin will be the world's global currency in 10 years. Now, I think that's it bunch of nonsense too but the point is it shows that there is a difference between bitcoin he's not against the bitcoin he's joining up that he doesn't want the fraud on his platform which i'm sure there's plenty of but the the fraud on his platform from people hyping individual icos there's a huge difference between bitcoin and an ico that's promising to do x y or z and that you're going to somehow get rich because it does this bitcoin isn't going to do anything it's either going to get used or bought, and that's about it. But it's not involved in a business plan. There is no business plan to Bitcoin. It, there's a white paper, and it explains the technical specs of it, but that's it. It's just a ledger, and there's nothing. To, there's no money. To, you, you don't send someone money, and someone doesn't send you money back or pay you more tokens because you bought Bitcoin. Huge difference there. Now, what is happening around the Bitcoin infrastructure, the core development, the light, lightning networks, the atomic swaps, and so on, but that's, not, that's not about Bitcoin. That's just stuff. That's, those are layers on top of Bitcoin. So here I say Twitter's ban has nothing to do with Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't thrive in advertising. There's a big difference between unregistered ICO and Bitcoin. And Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey says Bitcoin will eventually be the single global currency. So they're supportive of cryptocurrencies. They're just not supportive of the fraud involved in cryptocurrency. Now, some people say, well, Bitcoin itself is a fraud. But that's a different issue. That's not what they're saying. They're not saying Bitcoin or Litecoin is a fraud. They're saying they don't like the frauds around the ICOs. 
here's a luxury car dealer. You teams up with Bitflyer so they can, I guess, people with Bitcoin have a lot of money. They can buy these luxury cars. And my point on Bitcoin is there are no reliable fundamentals. I don't care what anybody says. It could easily be $20 or $20,000. And it has been both. And it can again be both. It can go to $20 and can go to $20,000. There is no way to value or price any of these cryptocurrencies. In fact, the ICOs, you're easier probably to come up with a valuation because if at least if they produce a white paper and say this crypto or this ICO, this token is going to represent the following things we're going to do. You might be able to value that. And you probably overvalue it. This is what they do today. But there's no way to value what Bitcoin is worth. It could be worth nothing. I mean, there's no no saying that anyone has to have it. There's no one relying on it. And uh, there's also no way to say it can't go to $200,000. Why wouldn't it? Why would it? Why wouldn't it? There's if people want it to be $200,000, it'll be there. If they don't want it to be there, it'll go down to zero. There's no there's no floor to it. There's no backing. There's no intrinsic value, so it could be zero. But by the same token, there's nothing stopping it because it doesn't have to rely on earnings. Okay. So crypto regulation, Tennessee passes a bill recognizing smart contracts. Belarus adopts a crypto accounting standard. Israel declares Bitcoin not a security and now the CBO guy, he's talking about he wants uh, Bitcoin ETFs. There you go. CBO recommends SEC allow Bitcoin exchange credit funds. So that's the argument that it goes higher. You get investors that just want to have exposure to the crypto space. They find the one or two ETFs that are sanctioned by the SEC. That's what they're allowed to invest in. They put their money in and it goes up. Not because Bitcoin did anything or is going to do anything. So, it would be very interesting to see. Now, Bcash is having its problems. It was removed from a couple of um, exchanges for certain trading pairs. It doesn't speak highly of the, what's the word, the outlook for that coin, but what do I know? Uh, India, digital gold sellers hope trickle will become a rush. India is going through a period where they're trying to, they've been trying to wean the people off the physical gold. Maybe the younger people might take some of their gold. Like in, These are like gold money type um services and they are getting somewhat of a pickup on them now i mentioned ireland seen a significant new gold mining region i've been covering this for a while there's been a few gold finds the last 10 15 years are developing them conamara mining very interesting development there and they have this special welsh gold there's some different there's some very interesting things going on in european mining asian gold yeah, Indian gold demand seems to be okay. It says subdued elsewhere. Well, in the U.S., mint, as well, I'll just mention it now. Why, why wait to get there? Only 2,500 American gold eagles in the one-ounce size were sold in March, and none of the other sizes. So basically, almost no gold sold in March. 915,000 American silver eagles. Not bad, but far below what we've been used to seeing the last 10 years. Silver, a new family of silver-based anti-cancer drugs discovered. We're seeing, you can take a look. I'm not going to go, this is from South Africa. I'm not going to go through the how it works, but University of Johannesburg discovered silver-based anti-cancer drug that is cheaper and less toxic. So some very encouraging news there on silver and its use. Now remember, this isn't going to create massive silver demand, but it does highlight that silver has unique properties that have a variety of uses and probably many more that we'll find in the coming years. Finland's first silver mine to start production next year. That's very important news too. We're seeing more European silver mining. At one point, Poland was a very significant silver miner, a mining area, but come less so in the last 100 or so years. Now, here you go, Bitcoin pumper. All hell will break loose, Abra CEO predicts. Bitcoin price boom will return this year. Okay, here's one. <laughs> Looking ahead to $20,000 Bitcoin via Forbes. There it is. They get this picture here. Bitcoin just going to skyrocket. The only thing, the reason I, you know, it's Bitcoin, however, as much as you get the pumpers, has at times lived up to the pump we just have not seen the same um successful pumps on um 
gold and especially silver. I mean, silver has really languished. And that probably indicates that uh, Bitcoin is more susceptible to pumping. It doesn't mean it's better. It just means that it's less known about it. There's less fundamentals. It's a smaller market, so it can go higher. But that doesn't stop. Here we go. $33,750 gold and 575 silver. Biggest wealth destruction in history. Of course it is. Game changers. Here we go. Game. This actually says that China launches global game changer. $20,000 plus gold and gold back you on plus dire warning. That sounds like something I wrote, but it wasn't. That actually was an actual headline from King World News. Game changer. Gold back you on. All in the same headline. I didn't make this stuff up. All right. Here we go. Now, this one's interesting. Sunday night, the supposed game changer happened. China introduced a part-time yuan-denominated oil futures contract not backed by gold. The result, the yuan is down. The yuan is down. First is the dollar. Gold and silver are also down. Does this make you more or less likely to believe the next gold pumper story? I think the correct answer is depends because you never know. There could be some truth in it. But 32% of the people said more likely. I don't know how... Unless someone's winding someone up, I don't know how it makes you more likely. Uh, makes me less likely, but I would still say depends. Always willing to listen to the next gold pumper story, especially if they mention Sun Tzu. It's very Sun Tzu. Gold's always set to skyrocket. Yeah, I think this is Peter Schiff. Yeah, it's always going to skyrocket. You'll see. You'll see. He's just early. He's just a decade early. Meanwhile, if you had invested in the S&P, just let it go up. You wouldn't have to be reading and listening to YouTubes to confirm the fact that one day gold is going to skyrocket when the dollar collapses. Here, all this is meaningless noise as once the breakout occurs and prices are headed significantly higher very quickly. When that happens, gold shorts are in for a world of hurt. Sun Tzu is going to smack them down. There we go. Uh-oh, and has <laughs> silver's time come? That's 10 years later when 500 ounces is going to buy you a house by 2015. Well, that time hasn't come yet, but it's on its way. Gold's game changer, silver time. And there goes gold and silver down. I mean, the pumping, I guess it's an art. I don't know what it is. It's an art. It's a living to pump gold, silver, Bitcoin, Litecoin, whatever it is. Chinese man in Japan, gold smuggling brought you ships for secret cargo transfer. So people are still smuggling gold. Some very interesting stories. I love the gold finds and the rare coin finds. This one looks like 2,000 year old rare coin discovered in Jerusalem. They don't, they look like they're around the Roman times. I guess when the Romans came, they used to steal the local inhabitants' uh, coins and they used to hide them. But these look like they're bronze coins. And they, they don't look like they're Roman coins. So they're of Roman era. But they're, they're bronze. I remember the Romans used predominantly silver coins. The denarius. It wasn't until the Byzantines. They basically introduced a gold coin. Well that about does. I want to thank you very much for listening. And uh, we'll talk to you during the week.